Back here on the Dean Show with our brother Ali. And so we talked about it's not your fault. It's something if, if uh, the belief in God, this belief sy system becomes quantum physics, if it becomes something so convoluted, uh, that's a red light, isn't it? That's, I mean, it's, you know, the, the Bedouin in the desert, uh, the truck driver, the carpenter. I mean, just y your average uh, layman who doesn't have much education, he just has maybe just common sense and he can understand, look, believe in one God. He's like, I'm in. That's it. Now you start getting all complicated. You make things. Th that means man's hands have been in it. They've complicated things. Could we make that? That's a fair assessment. I would say it's a very fair assessment, and you can even see it in other, uh, you, know, you can see it empirically from other uh, religious traditions. I mean, you have, you don't have very many converts to Hinduism, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, they have thousands and thousands of gods. It's usually a cultural, something you're sort of born into. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so a lot of the simple people in the world, they're not converting to these complicated, overly complicated religious traditions. Uh, you do have a lot of simple individuals converting to Christianity, but for the most part, they usually is because they don't understand even what a trinity means. You know, they're, they're, they're very much attached to the personality of Jesus, but they don't, if you gave them a book on the trinity, they would completely lose any sense for what Christianity even stands for. Yeah. So. It, it's not, the package is good. Look, uh, someone, uh, you know, love, 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 and just believe this, and you're going to paradise, and uh, God uh, sent you know, someone to die for your sins, you got a big uh, load of debt and yeah. you put it on the JC Gold card, but that's not okay. being, I mean, that, that's not being fair. I mean, that's not being. No, that, that's, it's a great marketing tool. Yeah. But in the end of the day, anybody who takes even a few minutes to comprehend or to contemplate what these things mean uh, will eventually, I think, yeah, honestly, though, honestly speaking, well, eventually, um, you know, not buy into it anymore. But yeah. I think Christians are primarily more emotionally attached to religion than they are intellectually. Yeah. And uh, that's not, I, and I don't really mean that as an insult because I mean, some of my teachers were Catholic philosophers and I respect them immensely for their, for their intellect. But the lay person, the common person on the street, you know, is not, it, it just, it doesn't, it, does, it goes over their head way too much. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, now you went from this whole journey, and now you had a Muslim friend, and he takes you into a mosque. I, I mean, this is what I tell people. A lot of the Islamophobes, you know, people who become experts Islam in Islam, they never stepped into a mosque. You know, they they never uh, 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 sat and really had a sincere one-to-one. Heartfelt, con uh, made a human connection with some Muslims and really sat with some scholars, uh, Muslim scholars to learn, but they all of a sudden become experts. You, were you scared? You actually, now you had a Muslim, he brought you into a, to a mosque. I think if more people did this first step, they just came into a mosque, asked questions, this would be a problem solver in itself. Yeah, um, I agree. I think this, this is a big problem, especially among the Islamophobes, that they don't have any sort of personal connection with Muslims in general. Or even the intellectual tradition, because they—I mean—they want nothing to do with it. Um, my journey towards Islam began in philosophy courses, which is interesting, mm -hmm. uh, because you often hear very negative connotations about what philosophy is and how it affects people's faith. Um, though I would argue that a deep understanding of philosophy actually leads you towards faith rather than the opposite. But that's maybe another conversation. Um, I was already sort of doubting to the point where I kind of lost my Christianity, so now I was venturing forth trying to find what was the true religion. So I still believed in God. I didn't make this superficial jump from religion all the way to atheism like a lot of these atheists do these days. Um, I was looking for which theory, uh, which construct explained God, explained religion the best. So I, I went, I looked at the Eastern religions, I looked at even Judaism, I looked at uh, you know, I, I, and then finally, actually, my last option was Islam because of the the negative portrayals in the media, uh, which you know I, I feel ashamed for having bought into at that time. But you know, we're not always perfectly rational human beings. You were a victim, like you felt victim, like many people, many millions have become victim to that. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, I wasn't like an open bigot or anything, but I still I had my reservations as a result of those images. 
So as I said, you know, humans aren't perfectly rational. I never claimed to be. So obviously, you know, some of the things that we believe in in our lives, you know, we can be illogical about. So, uh, but when I met this young man in my philosophy course, uh, he was very kind to me. He showed uh, great adab. Um, and for me, he was a good example. And so I followed him to the masjid for several months. Uh, I visited with the imams. And um, eventually, I was intellectually convinced of Islam. But, you know, there's, there's always a disconnect sometimes. You know, being intellectually convinced doesn't necessarily mean being spiritually convinced. And um, that came a little later. When uh, I had actually, uh, CARE was, I know CARE uh, in the U.S. is the, uh, was it, the Council of the American Islamic Religion? Religion. Yeah. yeah. They were doing this giveaway free Quran month or something for non-Muslims to sort of, you know. So I, I signed up for it. I was expecting this little pamphlet to come in the mail, you know, like maybe this tiny. Mm -hmm. They sent me this massive book. Actually, I have it in my bookshelf behind me. I should get it to show you. I, 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 yeah, I know what you're talking about. See it? Okay. Well, it's, 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 it's a like huge a, one. I got one also. Yeah, I've given yeah, it. Huge. Given one. And it came in the mail. It was so heavy. I couldn't. The gray I couldn't one. It's gray, right? Yeah. It gray, yeah. The, the black and yeah, the gold uh, calligraphy and uh -huh. they have on it. Muhammad you know, I thought they, Yeah, Muhammad Asad's translation. And I thought they had sent me, you know, more, more than one maybe by accident or something, I opened it up, massive, beautiful book, and I started reading it in uh, English, obviously, because I, I didn't know Arabic at the time, and uh, I remember getting to uh, the night journey, I think it was like 23, 24, where it specifically talks about your parents, and um, it was actually very heart-wrenching for me, because, you know, before I get to what the Aya says, because in my culture, you know, Spanish culture, it's, you're sort of, you're not very close to your parents. Then. I mean, you are, but not to the extent that, in a secular society, you, you know, once you hit 18, you're out the door. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you see your parents on holidays. And being disrespectful is sort of a normal thing. Okay, so, when it said, you know, have mercy on your parents, as they had mercy on you when, when they raised you when you were young, you know, that kind of, that 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 really I don't know how that clicked it just did, and it really hurt me actually I felt actually an extreme amount of pain in my heart. Um, that's the best way I can describe it. Uh, I felt guilty. I felt ashamed of myself. I felt absolutely wretched as a person. And even today, you know, I struggle trying to get over that cultural issue. But that was the first time that I felt that way about my behavior towards my mother. Mm -hmm my father and I remember when that hit me you know the first thing that I did and I was living in Chicago at the time it was really cold by the way outside mm -hmm. I remember going outside uh, without a jacket and I remember you know I saw my friend praying with his head to the ground and so I felt I had to be grateful so uh, the only way I knew how to be grateful in the context of Islam was to put my head to the ground I didn't know what I was doing so I picked a direction in the middle of the snow outside of my apartment where it's like, I don't know what temperature it was, <laughs> and I put my head to the ground and I said thank you. Uh, and I think that was the first time that I had the spiritual connection to Islam, which sort of finally confirmed in me um, what I should do. And um, there, there was one more thing that pushed me further, because even though I had that spiritual connection, even though I had the intellectual connection, I still was scared because, you know, the negative portrayals of Islam in the media. What were people going to think of me when I said I'm a Muslim now? Yeah. Somebody called a terrorist, a traitor, you know, treated like garbage, and that's actually what happened. Um, but before that, uh, getting the motivation to move in that direction, to finally take my shahada was when I was doing some research about my history. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, it was just you know, something I was curious about because I was reading about uh, Al-Andalus, you know, the time when the Muslims had taken Spain and had controlled Spain for quite some time, the Umayyad dynasty. And um, I wanted to know if my ancestors happened to maybe come from that, you know, that society, that civilization. 
So I started researching all that thing. And my Spanish last name was, was Rosario, which, uh, which in Spanish means like rosary. Uh, and rosaries in the Catholic tradition are like the, the tespi, the beads yeah. that you know a lot of Muslims use to do liquor. And I found out that my last name traced back only 500 years. I couldn't find any other records before that. And then I also found out that uh, 500 years ago from this time period, uh, was something called the Reconquista, which the Reconquista was the was when Queen Isabella from the north came in and invaded Spanish Al Andalus and conquered. So the Christians had conquered the Muslims and pushed us out. And all the Muslims remaining in that region were either forced to convert, were actually forced to convert to Catholicism, or to be exiled or killed. Mm-hmm. And they would change the names of the Muslims who were converted. So, for instance, uh, one of the names of the Moriscos, people who were forced to convert, was Rosario, because of the fact that these particular family members used to be seen with what they saw was the, the Tuspi. Yeah. So, I found out that my family had come from that period, that my ancestors could be traced back to the Moriscos, and in fact, my ancestors were, in fact, Muslims. Wow. 99% certainty. So... Um, so you were going back to uh, the original way, not yes. not not just spiritually. What was the original way with all the prophets, with Jesus, with even your family? Yeah. So I found out that actually my family members from way back were Muslims, uh, and then I looked at more of my history. I found out that my my great 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 grandparents had migrated from Spain to Puerto Rico, and then my grandparents migrated from Puerto Rico to New York, and then you know I was born. <laughs> you know, so. Very deep. Uh, we got a couple. We're almost out of time. A couple more questions. Can you tell me, you you had a dialogue with a the imam who in the masjid, and he had an argument. Something uh, that uh, you had said was very profound. Something about if God needed to have needed something about how did that argument go about the the sacrifice or crucifixion? What what was it? How was it? It was very profound. It was very deep. This goes back to sort of the, the doubts that I had regarding Isa and Islam being part of this trinity. So um, he he propounded this argument to me that was very close to my own understanding at the time, and I kind of I felt that um, at this point it was very sufficient. So basically, he said that if God was perfect, you know that means he doesn't need anything. Mm-hmm. That means he can't give anything up. He can't get rid of anything. You know he can't lose anything. But when you sacrifice something, it means that you have lost mm. something. And for any for a sacrifice to have any meaning, you actually have to lose something. It yeah. can't be symbolic. It can't just be like, oh, well, you know, I'm just calling it a sacrifice to make you feel better. No, it, you actually have to sacrifice something. So for Christian theology to work, there has to be an actual sacrifice. But in order for the concept of God in Christianity to work, he can't be able to sacrifice. Mm. He can't lose anything. He, he always has to be as he is. This goes back to the whole unchanging nature of God. So, you know, for, for God to, to say that God sacrifices, meaning that you're not talking about God anymore, you're talking about a human being, you're talking about something lower than God. Yeah. Um, so for me, this was sort of the, the, the eight ball in the pocket. That kind of closed it right there. It closed the deal for, for you coming. What, what was it now? The Okay, co- actually, two more questions. Uh, sure. Okay, now you... Now, that's it. You, you, you read the Quran. You actually you started uh, uh, really feel, feeling remorse. Uh, you started to connect more with its sim- simple message of only worshiping the Creator, not the creation. Uh, you came across that ayah about being grateful to God, to the Creator, about being good to your parents. You went out. You, you did what Jesus did. And he went a little further. It's, it's noted in the Bible. And he fell on his face and prayed to God. And we recommend for everyone to try this, to just reach out to the Creator alone. It's in the Lord's Prayer, actually, calling on God, just, just, just God alone, without any partners. You did that. You wanted to be thankful. You made the prostration. And for how far from here, did, uh, after this, did you actually accept Islam, submission to the Creator? Uh, well, it, it was about a six-month um, venture about learning about Islam. And I think about two or three months later, I finally took my Shahada. Like I said, very. it was reluctantly at first because I was scared. But yeah. then, of course, learning about my past and my history and my ancestors, 
it gave me that courage to finally say, okay, I don't care anymore. Yeah. I don't care what these people think. I don't care what the society thinks. This is who I am. This is me. Yeah. And I made that jump. I finally took my shahad. I finally gave myself up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for the next three years, um, you know, the blessings of Islam, I received many blessings as a result of coming to Islam. But society made me pay a very heavy price. Yeah. And, um, but alhamdulillah, I got over it. And I finally also took the courage to... Uh, to leave the United States and to venture across the other side of the world to learn about my religion uh, formally. Okay. So the, the, your, your, your eagerness uh, to learn more, you went to a university in Malaysia, a prestigious university in Malaysia, and you're actually doing your, this is the last question, you're doing your PhD, your thesis on the delusion of the anti-Islamic state, you know, Daesh on the yeah. ISIS, but we say the anti-Islamic state, th those who are actually have nothing to do with Islam. You're doing a thesis on this, uh, and that's why y you're there getting your PhD. Uh, finish off with this. Tell us about that. Oh, okay, sure. I'll, I'll try to be as concise as possible. Um, I came to Malaysia to learn about more about Islam. Uh, I was still doing my education in philosophy, which has helped me tremendously in dissecting sort of these ideologies and things that I'm that I've been you know dealing with uh, that I've been uh, researching and uh, you know actually I had a friend uh, back in the states young kid and I was working at a Dawah organization when I was uh, when I first converted and I saw him when he was like maybe 12 13 or so and uh, I learned while I was in Malaysia a couple of years later that he was attracted to joining ISIS and he got caught and now he's in jail and that was actually my first motivation to okay something needs to be done about this topic so I decided to take my philosophical learning, my, my learning in Islamic studies, now I'm doing a PhD in Islamic studies and I decided okay what is going on here why are these people doing what they're doing, why are they being extreme, why are they hurting people and um, now I'm doing my thesis, it's called the delusional state of ISIS, anti-Islamic <laughs> anti state, uh, Daesh. And uh, I found um, quite remarkably, though not surprisingly, that many of their ideas not, are not just not Islamic, but are derived from secular liberal principles, from their former ideology they used to adopt. Many of the leaders of ISIS are ex bathist who are mm. a secular Arab nationalist. Wow, many people don't know this. Say that again, that many of them are what? 17, for instance, of the top officials are ex bathist meaning that they are they were former secular Arab nationalists under Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Uh, their main architect is Haji Bakr, who was mm. one of the leading intelligence officers for Saddam Hussein. Uh, in other words, these guys are not, you know, whatever you want to call them, Salafi, Wahhabiya, you know, uh, you know, these they're farthest from that you can even consider. They don't even understand what they're doing. So you said many of them are secularists, they're, so and many of them are atheists. Uh, I don't know about their particular <laughs> theological backgrounds, but I will say that the former ideology they came from before becoming ISIS was secular Arab nationalism. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the principles they have about warfare, about war tactics, come, ex come from, like, copy and paste it from Western textbooks. Mm. I mean, it's not even, it's undeniable if you even read their treatises and things like this. There's nothing about them that it could be found in the Sunnah of the Prophet. It's on Allah, alayhi wa it's, sallam. It's, it's, it's impossible. Um, you know, and um, of course, many um, traditional scholars have come out against them, calling them uh, khawadij, uh, and, and, you know, they are, they are very much so. Um, but the ideology that they use to perpetuate these, these atrocities has had actually zero to do with Islam. And I'm not even saying that to, um, to protect Islam. That's not my motivation. You literally research the way they think and what they write about. And, and you can find it in Western textbooks, word for word, in many respects. Uh -huh. So it's not... It's not, uh, it's not... it's not... it's not even... Um, uh, it's, it's not debatable. Yeah. In a sense, for instance, if you look at their war tactics, and I'm just making one example, I know you don't have much time. Uh, one example is that uh, their understanding of, of retaliation, um, when they say that, oh, they kill our civilians so we can kill their civilians. Okay, first off, Islam is 
against this completely. Okay, there's every major scholar has ruled against this, uh, especially in the context of the Ayah of the Quran, Baqarah uh, 190, when it says, you know, um, uh, fight those who fight you, but do not transgress limits. They would say the limits include not doing what your enemy does uh, beyond the morality of the Sharia. So, you know, do not kill, if they kill your civilians, they kill your family, do not kill their family members, do not kill their civilians. But, you know, people like Osama bin Laden and all these other people, they say, well, that rule can be changed. Mm -hmm. that, that's not absolute. We can ignore what these other scholars have said about that because the West is doing it to us, so we can do it to them. Mm -hmm. So they're copying and pasting everything yeah. from secular liberal societies. Yeah. Why do you think when you see you had the Taiwan Tigers, they were, they were actually uh, Hind Hindus? In that period from 1980 to 2003, there were 315 completed suicide terrorist attacks by 462 suicide terrorists who actually killed themselves. I don't mean attempts. These are people who actually killed themselves. The world leader during that 24-year period was not an Islamic group at all. They're the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. The Tamil Tigers are a Marxist group, a secular group, a Hindu group. In fact, over half of those 462 suicide attackers were purely secular. Because you see, many uh, Muslim suicide terrorist groups are also pure, purely secular, such as the PKK in Turkey. Weren't they? They're Hindu, but they're secular nationals, primarily. They're Hindus. So, the, so you have a comparison there, but we didn't call, we didn't associate this with the Hindu religion. And they were actually, you know, doing suicide bombings, you know, terrorism. And then you had, for instance, the, the IRA. I mean, clear ca Catholics, but we didn't say this is the Catholic state doing this. So now you got... There's a, there's a, there's a, even if you go to Ireland, there's an Irish joke there. I don't know if you've heard it. It goes like this. It says, uh, uh, so um, one of these terrorist IRA members walks up to an Irishman. He goes, are you Catholic or Protestant? And the guy says, I'm an atheist. He says, are you a Catholic or Protestant atheist? <laughs> and then he shoots him. <laughs> so, um, you know, they don't really care too much for religion. Um, but you see the hypocrisy, the double standard. Now you have, you know, these um, uh, radical elements, the same as you have, in every, any, as the old saying goes, the few bad apples in every bunch, and you take these black sheep and you put them up as if they're, you know, representing Islam. You don't, you don't see this done as this example in the Tiger Tigers with the Hindus or with the... Uh, the Catholics, the, IR, the Irish uh, Republican Army, who are, you know, doing ma many things, you know, fighting for their freedoms and whatnot. You don't uh, associate the whole religion with these terrorist acts, right? You know, this, this is the standard, though, of secular liberal societies and the way they view things. I mean, for instance, like you mentioned, we don't take George Bush Jr., who bombed Iraq and Afghanistan and killed many countless civilians. We don't consider him to be the example of all Americans or, you know, of all the political, you know, uh, environment of the United States, you know, that would be unfair. But, uh, and everyone understands that, but when they're looking on the outside, when they're looking at their enemies, uh, all of a sudden that changes. Yeah. You, you, know, you know when uh, Dr. Uh, Pape, he's actually here, and uh, have you heard of him in, in, in Chicago? Some people claim that religion motivates terrorists, However, the academic research of Dr. Robert Pape has proved the claim to be false. Uh, what I did is I collected the first complete database of every suicide terrorist attack around the world since 1980. Uh, the first version of this database uh, uh, was uh, uh, published uh, a few years ago and it went from 1980 to 2003. Think of that as like the pre-Iraq database, and then the second version from 2004 uh, on, think of that as the data that's happened since Iraq. Um, and what the data shows quite clearly is that uh, the principal cause of suicide terrorism is foreign occupation. I mean, why don't they bring on more people like this? It's interesting. He doesn't suit the agenda. But someone like this who's a terrorism expert, I mean, it's, why doesn't he get money? He's, he's not Muslim. He's an expert in terrorism. That's Dr. Pape, University, I believe, of Chicago, if I'm not mistaken, who who is quoted. He is. He says that you know Islam has little to nothing to do with these terrorist uh, act. These are all politically uh, motivated uh, because of foreign invasions. 
Because you see, if Islam as uh, sort of a radical religion, or if it were just radical Muslims uh, doing this, then what you would expect is sort of this thin veneer of suicide attack kind of scattered all around the world. Uh, you would expect that, oh, there's 1.4 billion Muslims. You know, there's this teeny tiny fringe of Muslims kind of everywhere who'd be willing to do suicide attack. Uh, but that's not the way the data looks. It's really concentrated, and it's really concentrated in occupations. Do you know about his yeah. about his work? Yeah, and many other researchers actually have, have echoed those points. But the problem is the reason he's not popular, the reason that people don't want to put him in the mainstream is for, mainly, because if you start saying that it's not the other person's fault, then you have to start looking on the inside. Ah, and nobody wants to do that. So, uh, I, I'm, we're going a little bit over. I think we're going to have to make this a, du a double segment. I'm really enjoying talking to you. Uh, I, I was. I'm thinking. You know, these people, these these radicals who come on these. You know, why you being a philosophy major, someone who's a specialist in there, you get into the psyche of human beings. Wouldn't it help? If you wanted to solve the problem, Ali, that you brought on mainstream Muslim people who are out there representing Orthodox Islam, submission to the Creator, not the creation, you know, um, and bring them on Fox News, bring them on CNN. If there are lost souls which are there in every community, let us have the platform to call them back and to really show what Islam is about. Instead, people are out there like, why don't you condemn this, this common mantra, which, I mean, we don't have the platform to do so. And then you have these so-called experts out there who seem to be representing Islam. So now you have this thug-like mentality, this gang mentality, this guy in Nice and these other places who are at nightclubs, you know, beating their wives, uh, doing everything opposite, basically, of Islam. Now they go and do something, you know, it's like they join the gang. Now they're like already being discriminated. His name is already Muhammad. And now he's learning um, about Islam through these radical, you know, uh, um, politicians and whatnot. So he starts to think like, maybe this is my religion, right? So it's us against them. You follow me, and then he jumps on board, and he does some crazy thing. You get, you get what I'm saying. So I think they ra they end up radicalizing more people themselves. These these so-called, you know, uh, uh, radicalization even, even by itself is is quite uh, is very vague. It doesn't really explain anything because the bottom line is that the reason that these kids or these youth are becoming like this, and I, I know this is going to sound controversial, but is because they're are very much not radicals. Um, they're very much actually very normal people within the context of the societies they live in. Uh, no person living in a secular liberal society who follows secular liberal standards would think that it's a bad thing to fight for one's freedom or to fight against a tyrannical government or military with any means necessary. Mm -hmm. They only don't like it when they're the oppressors and the rebels on their side. Now, this doesn't, of course, ex excuse killing civilians. Obviously, this is horribly wrong. But if you're going to be a society that does not blink an eye, or is apathetic, or is passive, or in, for many extremes, uh, is supportive of the thousands of civilians that your military is slaughtering overseas, then you cannot be surprised that some people within that society who are having an identity crisis will copy those tactics. Yeah. Um, so the reason they won't bring on the mainstream, and I mentioned this earlier, is because it would cause them to have to do a bit of introspection, which for many human beings, whether individualistically or, or as a society, is almost an impossibility. Um, France is going through that right now as well. They did a recent report, I don't know if you heard this, it's, it's quite fascinating, but most of the foreign fighters joining ISIS are coming from French-speaking countries. Wow. Why? <laughs> uh, well, the reason is, if you're looking at it objectively, is that because French secularism is quite aggressive, and there's a lot of racism within these societies against minorities. Uh, however, French populations don't really want to listen to this part because that means they have to critique themselves and change themselves. So instead, they prefer to retaliate and bomb for the Nice attacks. Uh, for instance, uh, after the Nice attacks occurred, you know they struck ISIS and killed 126 civilians. Um, so this is a, this is a perpetual cycle because 
because the society that's sort of promoting, not promoting, but provoking these reactions in many ways. I'm not saying that the innocent people on the street have nothing to do with what's going on. It's only about just the governments and the militaries, the people in power. They, they don't want to look at themselves and say, okay, what am I doing? What am I doing that is poking the hornet's nest? Or why am I poking the hornet's nest? You know, they, they don't want to do this. And um, anytime anyone brings up these things or tries to have a balanced approach, they're considered somebody who's trying to justify terrorism or justify you know, extremism. And, and the whole conversation gets shut. But my simple answer to this is this. If you want extremism to stop, you need to stop extremism at home. And I'm not talking about your neighbor who wears a hijab. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about the policies that your governments are, are perpetuating across the world. Uh, Doctor, uh, one of my guests, former guest, Doctor Jonathan Brown. Uh, he's uh, here Jonathan? in the, yes, Professor yeah, Jonathan. Professor Jonathan Brown from, I believe, Georgetown University. He really uh, talks about this a lot. They don't. They they are, they hear so much about Muslims and violence, ISIS, and all this stuff. You look at the number of people ISIS. They go, I don't like ISIS. Okay, I don't support ISIS. Um, you know, there's lots of things they do that are absolutely unacceptable. But if you look at the number of people, let's say that the Egyptian government now has in prison number of people that the Egyptian government killed since the coup of 2013. I mean, you're talking about thousands and thousands of civilians. You know, maybe dozens of thousands of people in prison, uh, wrongly being tortured and raped in prison. I mean, is, you know, what, what's the difference between that and ISIS, really? I mean, you know, you're, you're talking about governments or, or, or organizations that kill thousands of innocent people in prison or, or torture thousands of innocent people. But no one thinks about, you know, all they hear, hear is how bad ISIS, they don't think about other things that, you know, so they, they, they are convinced that somehow Islam leads to these evils. But there's exactly the same number of evils or amount of evil being done by something that's absolutely, un, uh, that's not justified by Islam at all, or not even attempting to justify itself. So uh, I, I think this is, you know, ISIS exists because the United States invaded Iraq and destroyed all the institutions of that country and left it a complete mess. That's, that's a fact, okay? Uh, ISIS doesn't exist because of Islam, because Islam was in Iraq before 2003, and there was no Sunni extremists, there was no Sunni terrorism, there was no ISIS before 2003. This, result, this emerged in Iraq at, because of the United States invasion. That's what caused ISIS. Islam didn't cause ISIS. But if you look at the U.S. media, it's obsessed with getting people to talk about, is Islam the cause of ISIS? Is ISIS because of Islam? Why does it do, do that? Because the function of media and government is to prevent people from actually in this case, prevent them from actually reflecting on the actual causes of this phenomenon, which is United States uh, unjust warmongering. Because if people sat there and said, wait a second, we got taught into invading this country, it was a total disaster, now we have this ISIS business, then they might say, hmm, maybe we shouldn't go and invade countries the next time we're asked by our government to support a war. Uh, That's not what the kind of uh, power elite or the military media industrial complex wants. They don't want people thinking like that. So they have to sit and, and place the focus on some other cause. Oh, this is because of Islam. They don't want Americans actually thinking about what really causes these things. So when I, when I, when I, when I tell you know, Muslims or even non-Muslims about this, is don't be bamboozled by what you see on TV. It's very simple. I mean, it, I know it's obvious, but just because people say stuff a lot on TV doesn't make it true. Um, and also I had... Um another professor from uh, Loyola, uh, Professor uh, Omar, and they talk about how ISIS, uh, these extreme radical groups, they didn't even exist before many of these, uh, d- they didn't even exist at one time. This is usually, th- right, this happened as a consequence of the unjust wars, the, the warmongering, and, and um, you know, uh, this is a result of that. Obviously, Islam doesn't uh, condone killing of innocent uh, men, women, and children, but this is the, these are, these are the, ra- the consequences of that. Exactly, and, you know, Fox News is not going to, is not going to explain it like this. You know, they, they may say, oh, yeah, we made a mistake in Iraq, but they kind of just act like it was a bad joke. They don't even, they don't have any sort of real remorse in that, that should be there. They don't, they don't want any real change in this respect. Um, and, and you're right, you're right, uh, everyone who has, who has looked at this objectively says yes, without, if it had not been for the Iraq war, ISIS would not be here, but these, these, uh, these so-called experts in the mainstream are saying, well, no, they just opened the Quran one day and all of a sudden they want to kill people. That's, that's crazy. That's, 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 that's their argument in a nutshell. Oh, they read the Quran and now they want to kill people. 
I, I recommend our, our brother has got a great book um, because I often say Yahya Emerek. I say oh, if yeah. you don't if you don't want to remain an idiot because you got to be a complete idiot to think that Islam has anything to do with such evil acts like that, right? So I recommend and we'll, we'll finish off with that the complete idiot's guide to understanding Islam. You think that's a good place to start? You know, brother Yahya Emerek. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, not, not personally, but I know of him, yes. Yeah, great book. Start off with this. Real simple. Keep it easy because, uh, again, you've got to be a complete idiot to think that Islam is uh, promoting these evil actions. Is that a fair assessment, brother? That is a fair assessment. Uh, very fair assessment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Wonderful story, inshallah. God willing, we look forward to uh, uh, having you back again on the Dean Show. What do you think? Thank you so much, uh, and I, I, yeah, I'd really be great, actually. You know, there's a lot to talk about. So, and I, I really feel honored for being here. So, thank you so much for inviting me on. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Subscribe right now.